there's opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me talk about this. Oh, great. So, where do you guys want to sit? The event that they were doing and early. So. Oh, great. Yes. And Seth is on, uh, on <laughs> Seth is Twitter on duty, <laughs> as he would be. <laughs> thank you, Seth. everybody, for being so patient. I appreciate it. Uh, as you probably already know, I'm Terry Stratton, Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild. And, oh. <laughs> my mother who's now watching uh, online. <laughs> um, let me just remind you to silence your cell phones please. You don't need to turn them off if you want to uh, tweet or do anything like that to uh, tell everybody about the wonderful things our panel is saying. That would be great. Uh, on the back of your program you'll see my email address. If you have ideas for other seminars you'd be interested in in the new year, please let me know. I would like your feedback. That would be fantastic. I'm going to be sitting outside waiting for latecomers. When we have the um, question and answer session, if you have a question, please make sure you ask it very loudly so our online audience will be able to hear the question as well. <laughs> All right, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Christine Toy Johnson, who will be leading our conversation this evening. Thank you. Thank Yay. you. tech I, I honestly don't think I've ever been in a panel that's being live streamed and we can get Twitter it's a, it's a very exciting um, this I want to introduce this wonderful panel Kia Carthren Fernanda Koppel John Weidman Please. Um, well I wanted to um, let you know what what we what we're talking about today um, I was having a conversation with, with the lovely Seth Cotterman and, uh, and Gary Garrison one day about how perceptions that we have of ourselves and each other really impacts our storytelling. And it, it impacts our world, world view, how we populate the plays that we're writing, uh, what we're writing about. And um, it occurred to me that I really wanted to talk to these three great writers about how they're writing a lot of topics and people and characters that you might not assume that they would write about. And um, it, it occurred to me that uh, hearing from them about what their perceptions were of people that were not like themselves, how that was uh, inspiring them to write what they're writing and um, impacting uh, what they wanted to say in their in their place. So um, I've asked them um, to, to each um, start the conversation with um, telling us a little bit about the kinds of things that that spark their interest, that, that lead them on the road of, of choosing to write, to spend an, you know, an enormous amount of time and effort and years and blood and sweat and tears on, on a specific uh, topic or, or something. And I think I'm going to start with John. Uh, okay, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about a, a particular show that I wrote because it's the one which is most clearly on all fours with what, <coughs> you know, Christine is talking about. Um, and it was the first show I wrote, it was Pacific Overtures, which is uh, a musical about the consequences, well, it's a musical which is about uh, uh, Commodore Perry's expedition to Japan in 1853, which forced a country which had lived in isolation for 200, deliberately for 250 years, forced it into um, intercourse with the rest of the world. And um, uh, I had studied East Asian history, particularly modern Japanese history. I had majored in it in college, which was a very weird thing to do when I did it, which was in the <laughs> 60s. It was just, an, people didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> Asia was still a very alien place for white middle class guys like me from New York. Um, but that's what I did, and I came out of it fascinated by um, <clears throat> the history of particularly Japan, China as well, particularly Japan, and uh, I felt that I had, uh, I knew a whole bunch of stories that most other people uh, in this country uh, d didn't. And when I decided to sit down and write a play about the uh, Perry expedition, I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to approach it. Um, but I had a conversation with Hal Prince about it, and he said, well, you know, if 
if you want to tell the story from the from an American perspective, he said it's a relatively minor event in in American history, but a cataclysmic event from the Japanese point of view. It completely changed the history of the country. Um, surely that's the the perspective from which you want to examine these events. And I said, yeah, you're right, it is. And so, um, you know, uh, in tandem with Hal, Steve Sondheim and I set about telling this story, but. We had made a very deliberate decision to tell it from the point of view of people who weren't like us. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, American sailors on a steamship in 1853 would have been much like us either. <laughs> and you know, you always make these leaps when you're dealing with people from a, another period of time. Um, uh, but. The, the the story, the interesting part of the story, the important part of the story, uh, required us to tell it from the Japanese point of view, which is what we did. And um, you know, we were uh, challenged at the time, and have been challenged from time to time since then, uh, about how we could tell an authentic story from that point of view. And authentic is a very slippery word. I think we'll all be talking about it a lot. And the implication was that. Um, uh, if you were Japanese, you would be able to tell this story in a, in a way that would be emotionally, culturally, uh, historically accurate, and that if you weren't, you couldn't. And the, that's not wrong, except it is. It, I mean, what you, the, the authenticity, what we would produce was an authentic version of the story as it was perceived by three white middle class guys in New York writing about what happened to Japan. That is not inauthentic, it's just different. And um, uh, if it was done uh, for the right reasons, and I believe we were doing it for the right reasons because we thought it was a compelling story, um, um, uh, which involved the United States, involved the impact of something the United States had done, but which demonstrated what that impact, that almost casual impact was on another culture, then we thought we would wind up with something that would be compelling in the theater. And um, uh, I think we did. Um, but it, you know, we were all aware of the fact in 1975 um, uh, that we were not pretending to be Japanese, but that we were, we were telling a story from a perspective other than our own, although as soon as we assumed the perspective, then it became our own, however we eventually delivered it. That's a little convoluted, but it's, um, I mean, it, that's where the, that's where, that's how we operated as authors when we were dealing with a cast of characters who were different from us. Not only had they lived, you know, 150 years before we did, but they lived in another country, they spoke another language, and um, we did not see that as a bar to telling an honest story about, about who they were and what happened to them. I think it's really interesting that oh, um, you talked about how you took the show uh, to Japan, or that it was done in Tokyo. Yeah. And can you just to speak a little bit about yeah. the, the response there? We, um, the show was, was, was not done in Japan for a long time, and um, it, was, it was produced uh, at the New National Theater, I guess, about 10 years ago. And um, it was staged by an extraordinary Japanese director named Aman Miyamoto, who's a, a sort of a celebrity director in Japan. And um, Steve Sanam and I were both in Japan, in Tokyo, for different reasons. It's, he was receiving this sort of Japanese equivalent of the Nobel Prize, and I was like looking for work or something. <laughs> so we were both there. And um, so we, you know, uh, we went, and, uh, we, you know, with some trepidation. Primarily, not because, uh, why? Because we had taken um, uh, some, we had taken liberties with, with some of the facts of what had occurred and when things happened. And honestly, if we were writing the show now, I think I would be harder on myself about making the show work without doing that. But we had no idea how a Japanese audience, which, you know, a New York audience in 1975 only knew what we were telling them. They didn't know anything. There was no context that they brought into the theater. Um, but a Japanese audience obviously knew the story inside out. And, you know, what we discovered was that the Japanese audience was entirely relaxed and um, comfortable with what, you know, these American, this story these Americans had told about their country 
20 years, 25 years uh, previously, and it helped that it was a brilliant production. Um, but it was, it was, uh, I don't want to say reassuring, it was enormously gratifying to see that what we had done in New York with Japanese and Japanese American actors could then be picked up by a Japanese director and be done in Tokyo in Japanese for a Japanese audience and that they really responded to it and in fact that production was then picked up and brought back to New York and done at the Lincoln Center Festival in Japanese with English supertitles so that there was this extraordinarily satisfying circular trip that this that this show had made and um, honestly that production is the is the best production I've ever seen at the show. Was there any time that you were afraid to even approach the the subject matter, or or um, you were you were young and eager and uh, you know it, yeah. Uh, yeah I was young and eager and um, uh, you can add uh, arrogant to that I suppose <laughs> I mean it never I really do mean it I mean I, I I'm older than anybody else here so I can say the, the I went to a very good high school in New York and um, Asian history or Asian culture was never mentioned. It was as if that half of the world just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And um, at Harvard, um, majoring in East Asian studies was still, as I said, there was a very thin sliver of the student body that was interested in this material mm -hmm. at all. So I thought I came out of college with this as a kind of an expert. And um, uh, I mean, an expert in America, an expert in New York, um, and the fact that everybody in Japan knew what I knew and, you know, times a thousand, was sort of like that, that wasn't the point. It was just, it was, it was who I was dealing with in New York. Um, it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, things Japanese were very alien. There were no sushi restaurants. Maybe there were, there were a couple, <laughs> uh -huh. you know. But um, th th the, the way in which we have gotten comfortable with the Japanese and the Japanese have gotten comfortable with us was a, a, um, a very alien phenomenon then. There was very little, we, when we did the show, we did the show out of town in Washington. And in the first production, a group of uh, World War II veterans who were still around had purchased tickets in the front row. Wow. And when the show started, they got up and very uh, 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 visibly walked out. Wow. That's how, that's how long ago, that's how different the world was then. So that, um, wow. uh, you know, I use the word arrogant, arrogant in the sense that we felt we were dealing with, it was, we could sort of do what we, what we wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I spent a lot of time at the Japan Society while I was working on the show and afterwards, and I, so it's not as if it was being done in a Caucasian bubble, right. but it kind of was. Mm -hmm. It kind of was. You know? we'll, we'll come back to talking about a lot of your, your other work based on uh, based on a lot of historical characters. But I, I'd love to, to ask Fernando now um, about, uh, to, to let us know what's, uh, what you're writing about and what's, what's sparking your interest. When I sit down to write something? Yeah. Um, I think in the most general sense, I have to be obsessed about something, <laughs> either by love or hate. <laughs> uh, and whatever that is, it has to really be an obsession of mine, something that I'll still be obsessed with when I'm stuck on page 62 and I have no idea what's going to end, yeah. and I hate all my characters. Um, so I guess I start from that place, and then I like to do research, obviously, as much research as I can, especially if I'm doing something outside of the world that I'm from. Um, well, how, well, how is, what is your favorite way of um, researching people that are that are unlike uh, yourself? Um, well, I guess obviously reading. Reading is good. Um, also, I like to watch interviews. Uh, I like to watch. I like to observe people, uh, the way they speak, and all of like the general details that are foreign to me. And then I kind of just like to put all of the things that I researched away, because I think that sometimes you can get really stuck in the research, and the work can be become an encyclopedia and not a dramatic text. And then I kind of just write the first draft with whatever stuck. 
um, at that point from the details, from the things that I had remembered from the research or the people I spoke of or observed or whatever. And then I like to go back to the research. But basically, I think that your first draft should always come from an organic place of like bravery, that you absorbed whatever you wanted to absorb about the people that are furthest away from you. And then also the actors that you that you cast and the people in the production once this awesome work is produced, hopefully, bring a lot to it. So I feel like in the truest sense, since theater is so collaborative, what you need to bring to it is like your organic sort of perspective, your emotional connection to whatever you're writing about. And then you have so many people to help you with the rest. So like openness and organic sort of connection to whatever your subject is. What's the, um, what is a story or, or character that you've written that is <coughs> farthest away from who you are and, and your, inner, your inner circle of, of friends and family? What's the most um, different? I'd say a white male. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say that was very far away from me. And my issue with that character and, and those plays that I write would be the, not to have them be like a caricature. Right. Because I don't want that when I see plays about Latino people right. or gay people. I don't want that character to be that way. And so to be sort of kind and compassionate to all of your characters, no matter what they represent in your work, is something that has really helped me in that sense. Well, there's something, there's something um, about stereotypes and how um, it seems like if I could write a stereotypical Asian American person and kind of get away with it, except my friends would hate me. But um, but I could kind of get away with it more than than John could, right? And um, I think that's an interesting um, dance we we do. And I I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. If you're seeing, um, do you feel like it's more palatable if you see a stereotype about someone? Uh, that, like you or something that's written by someone not like you or do you know what I'm saying? Um, or, <laughs> oh, well, I oh, okay, mean, okay, say, um, I'll just use myself as an example. Sure. So, um, uh, on television, it's easy, it's, e it's easier to talk about some really horrible, uh, Asian American stereotypes that are on television right now. The first one that comes to mind is a sitcom called Two Broke Girls. There's this character that we, uh, He's just a, and and, and a, really, it's a male character. So uh, I'm I'm offended for my my male Asian American friends that he's um, sort of stereotypically nerdy, asexual, um, a, a, a sort of a buffoon, and and I and I cringe, and I I hope that it's not being written by uh, an an Asian American staff member, but. If it were, I don't. I don't know how it would. I, I would if I would feel worse. I, I guess I'm answering my own question in a way. It's just something. <laughs> well, I mean, I think TV is really different. Yeah. Um, in TV, there's a time crunch. <laughs> well, so there's, there's a friend is working on a on a television show, or she just finished one. I so just you can finished one. Yeah. Speak a little bit. There's about. a time crunch, so there's not that like delicious time we have in theater mm -hmm. where we can research and work on our plays and workshop it's very like quick um, there are also bosses and then bosses above those bosses and then bosses above those bosses and right. people with a lot of money and so ultimately I think stereotypes are more prevalent because of time mm, and also because of money <laughs> because people who are producing the shows or have the money don't have the most worldly view of these characters or these situations. So I think as the only Latino staff member on a show that was set on the border, I know that that wasn't always a priority. Mm -hmm. The way we we're representing everybody, the priority was to get everything done and to make it entertaining in the way that they all understand entertainment to be. Right. So it's hard because, you know, I've been in that position where I'm the only one <laughs> And, th and then they go back and they're like, no, we want it to be more like this, and this is a stereotype. Right. And, so and then you you're say, in this really tricky situation yeah. where it's like, you need to pay your bills. Right. <laughs> right. You know? right. And you're, 
and this is wrong, but at the same time in the bigger picture, you have to look at it in the bigger picture of like what this means to you. Not a lot of people of color write for television. Right. You're usually the only one in the room and it takes getting to certain levels to make things change. So it's different. Um, but I definitely think that the one thing I can say that my bosses had a lot of attention to detail on the show. So I think that authenticity was interpreted as details mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that setting. I mean, I, I, to me, it's uh, the question you're raising is most pro problematic in a, in a comedy right. in, in which uh, stereotypes, I mean, not necessarily, but, but in a comedy where a stereotype is used as a kind of a pandering shortcut to get cheap and easy laughs. Right. It's less of an issue in the theater than it is, I think, in a, a mass, some kind of mass entertainment uh -huh. film. Um, but um, in that case, I, I, you know, I, the pressure's on, I mean, if there's, if there's an Asian American writer who, who was being essentially was expected to deliver that character, mm -hmm. kind of covered. That's mm -hmm. a really, that's a bad situation. That's a bad situation. But I, but yeah. I would have sympathy for the writer who was in that, right. who'd been put in that position. You said something uh, last night when we chatted about this about an expectation of m when you're writing uh, musicals, um, uh, if it was set in another time period. Can you? Can you? I'm not. Yeah, no, no. It, 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 but musicals, uh, musicals uh, traditionally have been set in, uh, have not not involved contemporary characters. They've been set elsewhere, um, and usually uh, the period pieces, uh, whether it's uh, My Fair Lady or Oklahoma, or uh, because you know if you if 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 you're going to write a musical in which people are talking to each other the way we're talking to each other now, and then one of us started to sing, it's odd. But if you're in, if you're in, you know, if it's, if you're starting out with the idea that you're in France in 1870, uh, it's just an easier step out of this sort of exotic. Is that a word? Is that the word I want? This this otherness into song, and it's only recently that people really have uh, um, started to use contemporary characters, uh, tell contemporary stories uh, in the musical theater, and. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's still for the most part in order to make music work. A lot of people go to stories which are set in another time and another place. It just, I just yeah. was thinking about that because of the, the question of stereotypes, and I wonder if sometimes it's been um, more accepted to have those kind of stereotypes in musicals that are set um, in other periods because uh, it, we're not living in that world and so we can sort of keep an arm's length yeah, from it. Yeah, I think that's probably yeah. true. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to come back to that. Hia, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I know that you've been, you've been writing about a lot of things that people would say, I would never know that you would know something about that or I'm surprised that you're inspired by that. And Well, um, when you ask where I start off in democracy now. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I'm a political writer, so uh -huh. I always start with something political. So. You want me to elaborate? Yes, <laughs> I do. I do. Um, uh, well, I, a few years ago, I was fortunate that uh, the Guthrie Theater had these um, commissions where they got this big grant and they picked nine American playwrights. We could go wherever we wanted our world in the world and write about the experience. Wow. So uh, while so often my research does come from books, actually, I could do it there this time. So I went in 2004, I went to Liberia as they were transitioning out of their civil war. And um, mm. I, I, yeah, and then you write, a, yeah, you write the play. And so, um, that was actually interesting. You know, sometimes people think, um, oh, I'm black, and that's Africa, so therefore it's your culture, but right. it's actually a totally different right. culture. Right. Completely. Because you, where, did, where did you grow up? You, you yeah. were, tell Maryland us, right? in yeah. the Appalachians. Okay. But, yeah. so, but, um, it's pretty far away from Africa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, um, but I, I, yes, yeah, so, um, uh, so 
So yeah, I mean, part of it because there's a an American history, and part of it is a history play. Um, because it was settled by free American blacks with something called the American Colonization Society. It's a whole other story. But um, so part of his history play, and some of that is Americans, and then ultimately it's a big three act play. And by the end, it's completely given over to the Africans um, because it comes to the present um, about the time that I was there. And so. Um, when we did a workshop of it in Minneapolis with the Guthrie, it's interesting because there are lots of Liberians, um, hmm. expats in in uh, uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I wrote another play for the Children's Theater there with Somalis because there's a big, some, huge Somali community. So I had two Somali oh. girls. That was a whole different exploration of a different culture. But with this, um, they I had a person from the university who was like my. Uh, uh, guy, I don't know, say guy, my um, consultant, consultant. So he was really helpful, and uh, and he brought ten people there um, of um, from the community, and um, he was a little late. I think there was maybe one person there by the first act. There were a couple by the second act. Most didn't get there to the third act. Oh wow! But that didn't keep them from ripping it to shreds. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it was interesting because I could understand that because they're thinking, what does this American know, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. um, the interesting thing is <laughs> Liberians are very expressive. So in the theater, um, they were like so angry about it. When the theater didn't do it, they called the theater because they were so angry because the theater's not doing this play. <laughs> but, um, um, but it was, uh, but I had to... Some of what they said was re was useful, and I considered that and, and incorporated it. And some I had to uh, remember what happened there. And for example, part of it I was on the Firestone Plantation, which is uh, an, um, the American Firestone Plantation, and it's enormous. There's a million acres, and they turned it into rubber plantation and pay the people nickels and, you know, to do all this work, right? And uh, the only white person I met in Liberia was this person, this big blonde man who was like in charge there. It was very weird because I, I, the family sent me up this interview. Um, he didn't say anything. He was just like staring at me. But I was talking to the other people. It was very, very weird and creepy. But then we went to uh, to the workers, the tappers. They were coming back. And, um, and it was... I mean, um, I mean, it's a long story, but they were in these shacks with, you know, half the slats of the roof missing, and this was the rainy season, and uh, and it was just everybody. And the children came out, and they were really happy because there were people here that were not they. I mean, it was me and my family. My family was Liberian, but my family dressed. They have had a lot, they had comparably more money. I mean, everybody's poor there after right after the war, but they had comparably more money to these people that were desperately poor. So they came out because it was actually different people here. And um, and I uh, I remember I'm actually I always say I I could never be a journalist because I'm not very good with interviewing people because I'm always conflicted between. Um, wanting to understand the story to write and really feeling like I'm in other people's business. Hmm. But as it turns out, Liberian English is very, especially for working class people, is very hard for uh, Americans to understand. So my family were speaking to them anyway, and they just asked all these questions. So I found out, you know, these people that had to do a tap a ton of sap a month and all this and, and you know, no days off. and. Um, and as we were leaving, I'm almost going to wrap up in a song no, story. No, no, no. I got a question when you're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as we were about to leave, there were sort of two different places that we went. And a young man came out of the forest, and he started talking really quickly. And I thought this will be the person to say, what are you doing here? This is none of your business. And actually what he said was, um, I'm so glad you're here. 
somebody needs to finally tell our stories. Mm -hmm. So I had to balance that with the librarians in Minneapolis. Some of what they said certainly was legitimate, but other stuff, partly because they were angry again because somebody was talking about this. They said, Firestone, Firestone's not even an issue anymore. Nobody looks mm. And it was <laughs> totally an issue. And I had to balance what they said that was useful in terms of the culture with what I saw with my own eyes and what that man said to me right. about telling this story. And, and, the, and the point of what you wanted to say, getting really being the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I say, ultimately, the characters that I wrote were not the, the Minneapolis librarians. They were not the librarians that I saw. They were from my head, but it was right. enriched by understanding the culture. Right. I just have to say one last thing, which is all this is a horrible work they're doing of tapping all these trees. Um, the, the rubber, it's latex for our condoms. That's why there's this near slave labor there for wow. American condoms. Wow. Right? So, <laughs> That's nice. John, did you have a question? For well, me? I, you sort of answered it, but I, I was I, I, I wondered whether the the critical response from the librarian audience in mm -hmm. Minneapolis was m mostly about the politics of what you were presenting, or was about mm. she thinks that's us, but that's not us. She doesn't know who we are. I f I think she got I us think, wrong. Yes, I think the latter. But like I said, most of them didn't even get through to their third act. So I believe. <laughs> I'm not saying right or wrong, but I'm saying that they were upset in the first place. I was only there a couple of weeks, so I think they felt that I um, didn't didn't have the authority to write that. And um, uh, of course, the project was about Americans going to other countries, so it wasn't about a, a Liberian. But I, but yes, that's that's what I believe is that. Um, it, for example, somebody was this sort of says yes to both your questions in a way because a woman said that she was upset because I focused on women characters and uh, that uh, who were tappers actually and um, in, the, in the contemporary story and how women don't work outside the home and da 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 and uh, in Liberia and da 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 and I think it was just nine days before the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was elected in Liberia, the first female president of Africa. <laughs> it's wow. like, but they just sort of were ignoring that sort of reality, and no one brought that up. And because because of le legitimate fears about someone else, um, I, don't know if I would say co-opting the culture. I think they are afraid that it might be wrong. To the point, I think in this in this instance of maybe some of them deciding it was wrong before they heard it. Right. I think that's an interesting thing about uh, whether um, the important thing was that you heard from somebody, uh, thank you for telling the story. You know, that's that's a really powerful thing. Even when I was there. Yeah. Yes. I, yes. I, um, yes. I uh, actually made a documentary film with my Caucasian husband about the first non-Caucasian pro basketball player. He's a Japanese American guy from the 1947 Knicks. So this is 1947 <laughs> Knicks, right? And um, I'm Chinese American. So and I, but for some reason, uh, over this period of time, I ended up doing a lot of uh, research and work about. Uh, Japanese Americans in the 40s in the internment camps and and so some people would say well why are you interested that's what's offensive to me actually why are you interested in the a Japanese American story uh, I just I am but the the larger more important thing to both both Bruce and I was that the number of Japanese American people who came up to us had and still do and say thank you for telling this story mm -hmm. because um, and that's the bottom line I guess to us we say uh, whenever we feel um, even put on the defense of it all or put on the, on the spot made, made to think maybe we shouldn't uh, we don't have the right to tell the story that um, we are the ones who are telling the story we, mm -hmm. we actually made the film we're we're uh, getting the story out there and it's, it's had a, a really um, big impact um, John, I want to get back to talking about a lot of the, your your work being um, based on, or the things that you are yeah. res respond to uh, have a lot of historical. Yeah, most of what I've written for the musical theater has, has, has some historical something has 
caught my eye and has spurred my interest, and that's where the show's come from. And, um, you know, I mean, Assassins is probably the, the, the best known. Um, and, you know, the conceit in that piece, Steve Sondheim and I gathered together everybody who ever attacked the president and kind of put them together in one space and let them kind of interact with each other. But the process of dealing with those exactly, and I was listening to you, it's the, you know, I did a lot of research, uh, a lot of reading, um, and then I sort of set all that stuff aside and then in, basically invented the people. And the inventions were informed by and based on everything I, I'd absorbed, and then I kind of went back to the research to see if I wanted to tweak anything or change anything. Um, uh, and uh, didn't, but I, I always, I, you know, whenever I've written a historical figure, that's been sort of the, the, the approach. And uh, I think it's, if you're going to write a play, that has to be the approach. Ken Burns would deal with this material in a particular way, and it would be great. But uh, plays are not documentaries, and uh, so they have to be fueled by some, you know, author's impulse. I mean, I, I'm working on a piece which is sort of not finished yet, in which Charles Lindbergh is a character. And I, I mean, I have a view of Lindbergh, which Scott Berg, who wrote sort of the standard biography of Lindbergh, might not entirely subscribe to, but I believe it. And um, you can't talk me out of it because it makes psychological sense to me. And I think that's sort of a playwright's work. And um, you know, it when you but when you are starting with with uh, characters that people are familiar with in one way or another even if only glancingly um, you know you, you you people will say no that's that's not that's not John Wilkes Booth or that's not Lee Harvey Oswald I said well yeah it is that's my Lee Harvey Oswald you can go find your own if you don't like it. <laughs> I guess on the on the flip side of this whole conversation is um, if, whether or not I, I'm interested to know if whether whether or not any of you feel um, a responsibility, for lack of a better word, to write about your own culture, or your own family stories, and um, or who you're most uh, who you're most um, touched by. Um, well, we haven't we haven't talked to you for a while, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, in short. Uh, well, I mean, I look at theater right now and I don't see a lot of people like me um, and that really angers me <laughs> so I think it is important for me to continue to write stories that are close to home uh, also because sometimes that's really good work like mm -hmm. that's something that nobody can take away from you you are you have the authority on the authenticity of your own mm -hmm. life and what you've seen etc <clears throat> so I mean definitely yeah I do think twice sometimes when I sit down because I know that there's a lack of Latino playwrights and of them being produced and so I do feel like that's an important thing I also think it's an important thing to identify in that way also, as a gay woman, I think that's important, too. Um, so, yeah, I do think about it. I think it's really important to think about those things. And when you're, when you're populating the world of your play, do you, when you're writing it, do you specifically say this needs to be, even if, it, uh, if it's not a, a character that might need to be about, um, about race or, or ethnicity or sexual orientation, but, but somebody that could be of uh, many different, or any any uh, different kinds of, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. Do you write specifically in your script? Um, I've heard some people say, well, I know I write any, ethni uh, any ethnicity sometimes, or. Um, I've never done it. I like to write for actors that I see. Actors inspire me a lot. So if I see somebody I like that is of a different eth ethnicity, I'll write them in. <laughs> so. I've never done that before. I've seen other people do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just me personally. I'm, I work better with people that inspire me, and mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. write for people generally. Yeah. What, what about you, Kia? Do you feel a responsibility to um, write about your own uh, culture and your own kind of family experience? or? Well, I, I don't feel a responsibility, mm -hmm. but I usually like to write about it. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, I wrote a play about landmines and about U.S. responsibility for landmines around the world. And part of it 
there's an employee at General Electric and they're black. It was it was actually interesting because it's the first time I wrote about bourgeois blacks because I came from working class. I usually mm-hmm. write working class, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, I didn't just. I think sometimes in writing a not a, a play that's not about race, um, and that wasn't about race, but I just have to make all the characters black and uh-huh. <laughs> dealing uh-huh. with this issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, as you know, as the white man on the on the panel up here, I, the uh, I, you know, uh, uh, the country has given me a free pass to write whatever I want, and uh, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that's that underlies this entire conversation is the, the fact that um, uh, non-white male voices still have a great deal of difficulty being heard in the state spaces around this country, um, and I think you know, things have gotten better, but they, they, they have a, a long, long, long way to go. And um, uh, I think that a lot of what we're talking about will almost be self-correcting when the, a variety of voices have access to stages that they have to struggle to gain access to now. And, um, you know, uh, as I'm saying, you know, the, the, the 24, 2040, the majority will be the minority. And some of these issues are going to be simply self-correcting. Maybe we'll see. Um, but the theater is a place which, uh, you know, as a cultural institution, it should absolutely be leading the way. As I was sort of pulling the rest of the culture behind it, uh, it seems to me that it's positioned in, in a way that makes it possible for the theater to behave that way. And. Uh, Theater should do a better job. Commercial producers should do a better job, but not-for-profit should do it a better job. It's you know, if you if you if anybody read *Outrageous Fortune*, uh, Todd London's book about what it means to be a playwright in the United. First of all, you can't be a playwright in the United States. That's the, <laughs> by quantifying it, he demonstrated that it's actually not possible to be a playwright in the United States. Um, but that the the uh, yeah no read the book uh, but um, uh, nevertheless there are playwrights all over the United States I mean it's the two things are appear to be incompatible but they're not but it um, he also quantifies the, you know the how difficult it is to get original non-white male voices on stage and uh, it shouldn't be. No, I think, uh, I, I feel like it has a lot to do with going back to the word perceptions, perceptions of who, who people think we are and how we fit into the American landscape. Uh, I know um, I'm, I'm an actor as well as a writer and almost every um, new play that I have read um, in a, in a reading situation or audition for, um, if there is an Asian character, it's an Asian from Asia character. Uh, there's not a lot of Asian American stories, except for those of us who are trying to write write our own experience. And um, you know, for me, my personally, my my mother's side of the family has been here since the 1860s. So if, I, if it were assumed that I were writing about a Chinese story, I would have to do more research about Chinese from China than uh, people who grew up in Westchester County because that's where I grew up. And that's an interesting um, part of this puzzle, I think, about uh, trying to crack those assumptions of, of what kind of stories we um, we should be telling, or um, that we that we would be telling, um, and so I think that's why um, I'm so interested in hearing about all the variety of things that are on your on your minds and what um, inspires you to spend years and years and years, and blood, like I said, blood and sweat and tears on a particular uh, play or musical. Um, there's there's a quote I'm gonna bring I'm gonna put John on the spot a little again because um, I read <laughs> okay. Okay. I, he knows about this though. Um, I there evidently there is a the Melbourne Australia debut of Pacific Overtures coming up. Get your tickets. Yeah, and, um, still time to get there. <laughs> and uh, there was a there was an article uh, on I don't know some social media thing lately um, that quoted the director of this production as uh, saying that she was planning on doing uh, cross cultural and cross gender casting, which is really strange. 
uh, given the, I don't know if you know Pacific Overtures, but it's especially, especially strange in Pacific Overtures. Um, but this is the inflammatory uh, quote <laughs> that, that the, direct, the director said. Um, she said, this is a story by an American playwright uh, about a moment in Japanese history, so it doesn't claim any cultural authenticity. I know what she means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's it, the language dresses the idea up a little bit, but I mean, the, the essential statement is there, there, because Steve and I are not Japanese, there is no way we could write something which would be culturally authentic uh, set in Japan. And, um, you know, if what she means is we can't, um, we can't replicate or duplicate something which a Japanese playwright would write, I suppose she's right. But that doesn't mean there isn't, as I said earlier, an authenticity to what two uh, writers in New York who aren't Japanese would choose to write about this particular episode, writing it from the Japanese point of view. It's a, it's a, it's an, it's not odd, but it's, it's a disqualifying, it's a sort of a dismissive disqualifying right. statement right. that really needs to be examined, it seems to me. Um, um, you know, I think the more, you know, you know. At, at some point, we'll reach a point where um, ethnic identity is an option for uh, for uh, writers. The way it's an option for me. I mean, I could write about you know um, the fact that my father was Jewish and, and my mother wasn't if I wanted to, but I certainly don't have to, and I'm not letting anybody down if I don't. You know, <laughs> this is my country, man. You know, look at the government. And but it would be, it would be well, I, I don't. Don't get me. Don't get. Yeah, I don't want to. Don't misinterpret my politics. <laughs> but I, it it um, uh, to, to it would be terrific to reach a point where state, statements like that wouldn't occur to anybody. It doesn't. And I want to be clear. I don't mean that. Um, you know, uh, um, I remember uh, seeing the Colored Museum at the Public Theater mm -hmm. in whatever year that was, mm -hmm. and I thought this is an extraordinary piece of work. And I thought it's, I, f I felt like I was I was being allowed to, um, I was being let in on a conversation between George Wolf, and and that basically he was talking to a black audience, and that 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 was the that was the audience for the piece, but that. It was being made available to me. It's like I could come in the room and listen, mm -hmm. and um, uh, but that the experience a black audience was having of of the the you know the basis he was touching and how he was touching them would have a whole different resonance from than they would from from me because I had had different experience growing up in this country. Um, uh, but you know, and George has now worked in a lot of different areas, directed a lot of different things, you know, some of which are specific to black people, some of which aren't. And it just seems to me it would be great to reach a point where you didn't feel angry about, but that, because that was your word, about the way in which Latinos were being represented. Or not represented. Or not represented, right. and whether or not a Latino author was, was m m sort of misrepresenting the culture that he I'm, I'm stumbling now but it's just I feel like we're, we remain in a in a in a very very difficult place for people writing from uh, anything other than a, a majority perspective I just have a question yeah that's the director yeah. you said. Is she Japanese Australian? Or oh, something? I don't think so. No, I mean, it sounds to me it's just like an excuse because she wants to do whatever she wants with the well, place. Exactly. Actually, actually, yeah. that's, yes. that's exactly, that's exactly right. what it is. You know, it's it's so anything goes. I can do whatever I want because a Japanese person didn't write this. So, yeah, whatever. And I'm a Japanese, but that doesn't matter. Right. 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 I know. It's very interesting. And actually, she reads her contract, the theater's contract, with the licensing contract. She can't do that. Right. <laughs> you can control right. what your play looks like on stage. Not yeah. entirely, but but you can, you can. Have you ever had a case where, um, well, for example, I read about, uh, I don't know, if there was a production of Hairspray uh, being done somewhere in Texas over the last year or two um, where 
there, was, there were maybe no African American people in the show, which seems ridiculous because it's about race. But, but um, I, actually, there, I think there was a quote from Mark Shaman that said, "Well, they did the play, so it's yeah. okay." But, but I, I just yeah. uh, don't call me on that. But I believe I read that because I was surprised that he was okay with it. But have you ever had, or have any of you ever had, the uh, instance where a play that you've written specifically um, about uh, where where the the gender, ethnicity, presence or absence of disability, any of those things are really germane to your story, and they have, n and and the person who's the or the company that's do done the show have not honored those things? Um, no. I mean, not, I'm sure there have been productions of Pacific Overtures, you know, that have, that have not been cast entirely with Asian or Asian American actors, but I haven't seen them. Uh, but I'm sure it's happened. The show's not done that often. Right, so it's, right. Uh, you know, it's not like Hairspray. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I can show you my bank account. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, it's interesting that because I was in the in the Off Broadway revival of it, where you where it mirrored the um, original Broadway production in that all of the the women's roles were played by men in the style of uh, traditional no theater, and then in the Roundabout Theater revival, uh, you you guys chose to do um, to have the women women's roles played by yeah, or uh, honestly, it was you know I mean that when I go back to the idea, this, I use the word arrogance, but I mean you know I mean. Um, Hal Prince wanted to create this sort of amalgam of kabuki theater and American musical theater, which was a really interesting idea because kabuki is big and vivid, and 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 there was this, so there were certain decisions that were that in retrospect seemed kind of self-indulgent. It's like okay, you know what, we, you know we'll have the the women played by men because that's the, the Japanese theatrical tradition. But honestly, uh, you know, when Steve and I saw the piece in Tokyo. Where the women women played women, it was like, oh look, it's it's much more affecting. Mm. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like a, a, you know. I think what always felt like kind of a gimmick, and and you know the Japanese, you know, as I said the, in this production, um, Aman Miyamoto did it the way he wanted to do it, which was fine, and it, you know there were the actresses were wonderful, and, and when we did it the roundabout, it was like, yeah, no, let's get rid of that. That was that wasn't. That seemed like a good idea at the time, but it doesn't seem like a good idea anymore. Interesting. Yeah. And you then you wouldn't have any Sopranos, right? If it well, I mean, wasn't that well, a problem? Yeah, that was, that's, that's right. Well, Steve, Steve had written, uh, you know, Steve always writes for for his actors, and uh, you know, including uh -huh. Mako, who sort of could sing. But you know, so what? And because he writes slowly, the show is all cast, and so he was writing for whatever oh, vocal, oh, the, uh -huh. whatever. Um, vocal skills were already in the company. Well, and so in the in the Broadway production and our uh, our revival, the women um, were Kurogo during the play, which is the stage hands. So yeah. we had black hoods over our heads until the very last number, which was supposed to be modern day Japan. So that the women uh -huh. women were in the in society. Um, but so that was that was kind of deep too, because to be a woman. With a hood uh, in your first Sondheim <laughs> show, um, really took its toll for a while. I, I have to say, but yeah. um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, got the finale. But, but it's not the finale. Yes, you can see. I mean, that you know, the, the, the way uh, Christine describes it, it's like that was you know, it was an idea built into the way the show was right. going to be staged. It's this very traditional sort of Japanese theatrical concept that the women. You know the sort of stagehands and the women's roles are played by men, but then when we sort of slam into the future, it's like, of course, the women will come out as women. Right. It's only one number. I'm I know. <laughs> yeah, the really yeah. difficult one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> surprise. Yeah. Um, maybe we should take some questions. How's that? Anybody have any? Yeah. I have a question about when you were in Liberia. You refer to your family. Was that a family that was assigned to you, or did your own real personal family travel there with you? No, actually, I, I, when I decided to go, it was because there were all these uh, other different places I wanted to go. I couldn't decide, and um, and uh, I was somehow drawn in 2003, which is when we got this grant. 
That's actually when the um, rebels descended upon Monrovia and sort of all hell broke loose. The war had been going on for like, depending on how you count, 14 or 20 years, but then suddenly it was the news. It sort of disappeared from the news and it was all over the news. I was really, there was something about, I was really drawn uh, to go there, but it took me like a year because of everything that was going on before I was able to make a connection. A friend of mine, another playwright who was, um, she went to a different place, she suggested to go through the universities and about a year later they were sort of finally coming round in Monrovia and through them, I made a connection of an American who'd lived there years and years, but was back here for years. But she, it was a former student of hers who had grown up in his family. So I, um, so I went there, yeah, and them, and when I got off the phone, because there have been some weird emails. I remember when I got off the plane, which was only once a week, I was like, if I don't see them, I'm getting right back on that plane. <laughs> but, um, but there was only one there, plane yes. a week that would go, wow. At that time, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they took you under their wing and... Yes, yeah, so and they set me up with these, yeah, these wonderful meetings, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I never would have gotten into those people at Firestone, which really an education, but also to uh, refugee camps. I got to meet the person with the the big refugee, uh, the what was it called, the I Triple R C, the International Refugee Something Committee. Um, yeah, it was it, it was an incredible sad, depressing, um, a little scary, kind mm. of amazing trip, mm. but yeah. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Tim. Uh, just based on the stories that you've shared with us tonight, I get the impression, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that it's fair to say that as playwrights, you have a responsibility, you feel you have a personal responsibility both towards the world as it is and the world that you want it to be. Um, and I'll put it another way, uh, reality versus truth. And I guess my question is, I'd love to hear from all of you what your personal compass is and when, when those two things aren't the same thing. Like, where do you go, where do you lean towards when you encounter that, that sort of thing? <laughs> if that makes sense. If I'm, if I'm hearing you right, reality versus truth, truth is more important to me, um, which is to say uh, that, for example, when I was talking about Liberia, I made up fictional characters, but that they come to a certain universal truth. Um, I don't know what the question well, is. <laughs> I, I guess, to, to speak specifically to that story, uh, what is it that causes you to say, no, these characters are going to do what I want versus what uh, an authentic critic might suggest that they do. Like, what's your barometer for that? And when do you make the tough call? How do you make the tough calls? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll just say about this. It's not. This is actually not the only play I've written, but this is yeah. <laughs> coming back to it. But um, you know, an interesting thing about this. A zillion years ago, I read Augusto Bowles' Theater of the Oppressed. It was so long ago, I don't remember much about it, but the one thing that always stayed with me was that if an audience, if you're doing political theater and an audience leaves so devastated that all they can do is throw up their hands in despair, then you've really not done anything because they're not going to do anything, right? They're just going to say there's nothing to be done, that you should provide a little bit of hope. And I tried to stay by that since then, but it has to be truth. It can't be a forced happy ending. When I went to Liberia, everything was so depressing. I mean, there were things like we went to the to Liberian Broadcasting Society where it was like, you know, part of it was built, you know, rebuilt after the war. But one part we went to it was all black just where been all the whole building was burnt and all you could see was ex exit signs mm -hmm. and this like frame and the buses mm -hmm. that were all burnt. People were walking for miles and miles because there weren't any buses. There were bullet holes everywhere. There was no electricity or hot water. My family had um, a generator. So we had a little bit of generated electricity for a few hours a day. Um, so, so the thing was for the most part, we went to the bush. That was like the scariest part. We spent a weekend there because they, the um, rebels, because there was no, 
TV or radio that went out there. There was a little bit finally in the city, but it didn't go out there. So they didn't know the war was supposed to be over, right? So that was the great. But people, people in the in the city did, and so people felt much better than even a year before if I had gone much, much better in terms of safety, but it was just so depressing because there was no money. There should be, which is a whole other story of how much the U.S. owes that country, but I'll like save that for another time. But um, I like on that plantation where they're getting all this money at Firestone. But uh, so I wasn't sure that I could write the hope at the end of this play and that um, without forcing it. What happened was when I wrote that play, and I kind of wrote it in the order from start to finish, starting 18th century and sort of coming round, the irony was when I got to the end going in order, the journey that it went on uh, became so much about the resiliency of humanity. It is actually the most hopeful ending I've ever ended, and it was I've ever written, and it was totally organic. I did not see that coming at all. So, does that answer your question a little? Okay. Do you want to respond to it? I don't know. That was really good. <laughs> How can you follow that? <laughs> the words of wisdom. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I agree with what Kia is saying. I think that you can't really write reality. We're writers. It's heightened reality. Mm -hmm. It's the theater. So ultimately, your characters are leading to a certain truth, a certain point that you're trying to make, and that should be your compass, you know? Which is, I think, kind of what you said. But. Yeah, and I, no, I would absolutely agree. That was very well put. I mean, I think that, you know, um, as I said, almost everything I've written has got some basis in history. Um, and there's no, you know, nobody writes, no playwright writes a documentary. And, you know, I tend to look at historical material, and, and you know, most of the stuff is either about Americans behaving badly or uh, Americans who have been pushed into a position where we perceive them as behaving badly, and they are, but there's a, it's an exploration for the reason for that. And um, uh, the, particularly because they're musicals, it's easier to, to heighten the characters, to lift them to a place where, where they can separate from whatever you would read about them in a book and behave the way I want them to in order to, to deliver the, the whatever the thing is that I want the show to deliver. Oh, uh, yes. I have a question. Um, how would you feel, let's say, in the Pacific Overtures, if uh, the Japanese characters were played by Americans as it was in Broadway originally, as I understand, and the uh, uh, Americans played by Jap the Japanese played by Americans. Well, no, the 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 the, uh, the cast of the original Broadway production were all either Asian Americans or Asians. Oh. Uh, the um, uh, and sort of the conceit was, I mean, it, that was essential. That was felt that that was important. So we, the story is being told from the sort of a Japanese perspective, and so it was kind of their story. And having uh, you know Perry appeared as a a kind of a, a nightmare figure from a Japanese ghost story, um, uh, not somebody you know a recognizable figure played by a, a Caucasian actor, uh, and th it has always been uh, it's always been the, our intention that when the play is when the piece is done, it should be done that way. Uh, and uh, there are times when uh, you know I mean well the production that uh, Christine was in you know it. Especially, what was 1985 something? 85. Mm -hmm. The opportunities for Asian American actors uh, are, are in those days were extraordinarily limited. They still are, but I mean, in those days, they, you know, to, to assemble a, um, a cast uh, could be a challenge. But it's an it's an essential part of, of of what the show's intention is. So it's better not to have it done than than to have it done with. Whatever that, <laughs> whatever that, whatever was going to happen in Australia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you? Um, yes, I'm interested. Um, you said your Pacific Overture was translated into Japanese, um, and I'm wondering. Well, were you asked, for example, to 
it was just a direct translation, or were you asked to um, bring in any kind of cultural um, aspects for from their point of view um, to sort of tailor it a little bit towards them or anything like that? No, no. The, the production that we saw in, in Japan was a production which we only came to Steve and I as audience members. Whatever, the, oh. the, whoever had, the translation had been done in Japan. Um, uh, and we had not seen it, and if we had it, I mean, we could have, I suppose, we could have asked for a little translation of the Japanese translation back into English. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when the, when the piece came uh, back to New York, and then to the Kennedy Center, mm -hmm. with super titles, the, the Japanese translation was translated back into super titles, and we tweaked those. But again, I mean, even, you know, again, given sort of what the show's about, that was, an, I was saying to these guys, I mean, we could, I suppose Steve and I could have said, no, no, don't translate the Japanese back into English. Just take the play and right. take the piece and put the dialogue up there. And, you know, if it doesn't quite fit, it doesn't matter. But we wanted to, we wanted the language to have taken this journey from English into Japanese and then from Japanese so back into English, you know. And with some of Sondheim's lyrics, that was a challenge. I bet. I bet. Yeah. If I could continue, how would, has anybody's plays been translated or anything? Or have that ever come up of translation and then trying to sort of look at it from their point of view as well? Or I had a play translated to Hungarian. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I don't know why. It was but you actually, have no idea what, what they were yeah. really saying, though, then, probably. Let's just be no, I never heard it. I never heard it. <laughs> but it was um, a dramaturg from Hungary who was here, and he just wanted to do this collection of American plays, and he liked one of my plays. So I, I have the book. I have huh. no idea what it says, but that's kind of, I see my name. That's, that's funny. Wow. <laughs> Um, none of my plays have been translated, but the show that I worked on, uh, we did have bilingual subtitled scenes in Spanish, mm -hmm. um, but they were all written in English. Sometimes I helped translate them, um, sometimes I didn't because it's a very long process, but yeah, it was always written in English and then subtitled, translated into Spanish. Oh. Uh, yeah, Adam. Um, yeah, uh, John talked a little bit about Pacific Overtures, how it not only, you know, told this story of Japanese history from a Japanese perspective, but the show also utilized you know, traditions of kabuki, and there's, you know, haiku in the lyrics. Um, and a question that I had for all the writers is when you uh, become interested in telling a story um, with characters uh, from another culture, do you also look to that culture in terms of how you tell that story? Mm -hmm. oh. Question. You know, I guess I mean Pacific Ocean is sort of is kind of a standalone for me as far as that goes. I mean, it uh, uh, you know as I said, I'm, you know, it, uh, it's still an American musical. I it, guess the, yeah. the bottom line is. It, yeah, it, right. it, absolutely. And yeah. how you know it's quite insistent on that. I mean, I it's you know I talked about John Wilkes Booth earlier. I mean, Assassins has got. Um, uh, a variety of, of characters who wound up in America, but um, you know, what if I was writing a piece about John Wilkes Booth? I mean, I think there's a there's a there's a it's not the same, but there's a kind of research that involves trying to that would involve trying to sink into whatever his kind of cultural surround was, what it was like to be a southerner of his class in the middle of the nineteenth century. Um, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not quite sure what that would involve, but um, uh, the Pacific Ocean is really the only time I've, you know, sort of inhaled a, 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 a story from an, uh, from elsewhere, and, and uh, you know, and as I said, you know, when I came to it, I had a background, of, an, an academic background, admittedly, but I spent three years really living inside. Uh, East Asian history and culture, so it, I, I, the home, a lot of the homework had been done. Whether it was enough, that's another question. But do you guys want to respond to that? Um, well, with the Liberia play, I mean, I it's so such a specific, as I said, accent. I could never get that. I would have. I mean, some people would talk. It sounded just American. It was like a wide range. I wish it could have been better at that. One thing after the Minneapolis Liberians, one criticism was 
they wanted more like they want Liberian proverbs in it, and mm. I, the interesting. And I added them. I actually like them. I, I had deliberately avoided that because I thought sometimes that can be an exoticism of cultures. Mm -hmm. That we, mm -hmm. and um, but when they asked it, I looked into it, and I and I actually liked that these things were very specifically Liberian. I guess that's the, that, that is that there is this fine line maybe between um, perception of it being co-opting, co-opting a culture and integrating something from it to provide authenticity. And that's, that's really a, an interesting fine line. Well, I didn't think so much co-opting. I just thought sometimes people, you know, the wise African in there. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I think yeah, I yeah. was afraid that it was going right. to be some sort of stereotype. Right, right. And, uh, but then because she said that, I looked it in and I did it in a way that I was hoping wasn't stereotypical, but at least it was something that hopefully that Liberians would recognize this if they saw it because, mm -hmm. uh, because they're specifically to Liberian specific. Okay. I got it. <laughs> well, I to, the, here's a sh short story I'll tell, which is not exactly on all fours with what we're talking about, but I just I remembered it. I think it's inter it is interesting in terms of what we're talking about. On the, the first anniversary of the, of the tsunami, a large part of the, of the theater community, or a, a part of it, came together mm -hmm. to create this event. Um, at Cooper, and it happened at Cooper Union, um, but it happened in a variety of different uh, places around the country simultaneously. And the, the intention was to raise as much money as possible for the theater community in Japan, which had been damaged uh, by this event. And um, what we did, and it was sort of driven by the public theater, but 10 Japanese playwrights wrote 10-minute uh, plays. And 10 American playwrights wrote 10-minute plays. And, and, and for the, some of the Americans, it was a matter of adapting uh, work that already existed. Um, Steve and I took uh, two songs from from Pacific Overtures, and he rewrote the lyric, and I rewrote the interstitial oh. dialogue. Um, but Doug Wright wrote an, a, an original piece that was fascinating, and Susan Laurie Parks wrote one, and Philip Kangotan did. I mean, but the, and the but and the Japanese pieces were the the the, the kind of mashup of people from Japan writing about this and people in the United States who, who wanted to write about it to create this evening, the, it was extraordinary to see what the, the, the differences mm. were between mm. these contributions from, from both sides of the Pacific. I mean, one from the place where the disaster had occurred and the other from New York where people wanted to respond to the disaster in some way that would be helpful. Um, and uh, that the story's not going to place beyond that, but it's, I mean, it's, it was a very rare experience to be engaged with this material in that way, and it was, it was very moving and very powerful. The mm. stuff that came from Japan was amazing. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, wait, let me, see, because we've heard from you before. Yeah. Um, just a, a couple of questions or thoughts. One would be is that I think many of us have at some point been on both sides of this divide. I know myself. Um, um, as a gay man, there are times when I will see materials and go like, who wrote that and why? On the other hand, then I turn around and I write about another cult, another cult, another cultural experience. So my question is, is that no culture, no world is static. There's cultural drift. Things change. I know that I've looked back at plays that meant something to me at some point and go and horrified at what I find. Um, so my question would be, is in, over your career or careers, have you gone through the experience of something that you treasured that was at some point culturally relevant to you or abhorrent to you, maybe the other side, that now as over time you've come back to and look at like, that wasn't a touchstone or that's actually more stereotypical than I ever thought, or there's something underneath what usually, what before repelled me that I can see the value of. Maybe not, I don't know, just mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's natural to grow as a person. I mean, not that I have had the longest career ever <laughs> at this point, but like when you look at someone like Almodovar, 
and you look at his really early films, he has this film called Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. And I'm sure something really inspired him at the time. <laughs> but when you watch it now, it's it's so dark and creepy and unlike his, other, yeah, unlike his other things, and it, it made me feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> and I know that he was he was like in his 20s and he was like saying something about something, but so I think that's like. And now his work has evolved, and he's like this master, and all his details and his, you know, films are amazing. But I think they, that's normal. You know, that's something that you write. Ten years, um, you wrote ten years ago that you don't agree with now. Um, and even when you're working on a play, I studied with Marsha Norman, and she has this rule, like two-year rule where if you've been working on a play for over two years, it's time to give it a break or something like that. <laughs> because you probably change within like a three year cycle, you probably have different opinions, that, you know, stuff like that. So I think that if you think the same about your plays that you wrote 10 years ago, then you need to, you know, go outside and meet new people. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're lucky we're not politicians, though, so we hold it up right. and <laughs> later on. <laughs> you change your mind! <laughs> every, every time there's been a, a new, sort of, relatively prominent production of Pacific Overtures, I've rewritten it. Yeah. Um, I cut stuff, change stuff, and there's some, there's some stuff in it that is difficult to change, that resists change for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. some of which have to do with plot, some of which have to do with the fact that they're uh, it's sort of embedded in the score, so that there's a limitation on that. But, but uh, you know, you can't do that so easily with a film, but you can do it with a stage mm -hmm. piece. And it's, and I, I, I keep trying to sort of sand, the, sand down the parts that I'm not so happy with for a variety of reasons, some mm -hmm. of which do have to do with having made choices that I f make me a little squirmy at this point mm. in a way that they didn't in 1976. Can you give an example? Uh, this I, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is a sort of ham-fisted example, but there, there, um, there were a couple of things that were just that I wrote that were described as haiku, and the the distribution of syllables in the three lines is correct, but they have uh, they have absolutely no, it was sort of used for humor in a sense. They have absolutely nothing to do with the sensibility of an actual haiku. So it's like I've changed, instead of them being introduced as a, a haiku, it's like a proverb or something like that. So, and, and so that's a very small example, but there, there's a couple of scenes that I've cut, because they some of that has to, that had to do with dramaturgical issues, not cultural issues. But the, you know, there are things that if we, if, you know, if Steve and I, you know, um, could sit down and like do a inhale the whole thing and exhale it. And I think that there are things that we would change now that it would never have occurred to us to mm. change previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, for uh, pieces like uh, Porgy and Bess, that's, that's stipulated by the family who owns the copyrights that it can only be done by a black cast. Whites are not allowed to uh, portray <coughs> blacks there. Um, uh, what are your feelings in that, um, is it better not to have the work done at all, or to have the, uh, the interchange of the, of the races there? Oh, uh, so you're talking about casting now? Casting, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Another one, for instance, uh, um, Madame Butterfly. Uh, well, now, opera is different, though. It, it, historically, opera has Sorry. been, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to yeah. interrupt you there, but... No, that's okay, I'm just, uh, what, what are, are your views regarding uh, <laughs> regarding something like this is better not to do Porky and Bess at all than to have it done with Black uh, face, yeah. whites uh, no. impersonating blacks? My own feeling is that I have always believed in colorblind casting unless race is is the issue in the play, mm -hmm. in which case right. you, you that's it. You can't do... I, I don't want to see Porky and Bess with white people because it's not... There's a white sheriff who comes in right. it's to a black, much community. Of a black community, so it's like, yeah. what, are, what you know, what are we talking about? There, uh, there, there is no white version of Porgy and Bess. It's not Porgy and Bess. <laughs> something like uh, Madam Butterfly. Well, as you know, as Christine said, yeah. the opera has convention traditionally been a place that was about the voice, and people didn't worry so much about, you know, I mean. Beautiful young women were played by 300 right. pounds. It was, it, 
it you know it was about the sound. And the difference, Until I think, Peter in, Hill. Right. Right. The difference, but, though, in the opera world is that everybody played every uh, different role. So it was, um, it was the convention was that. Uh, uh, an Asian American person could play an Italian person and a, an yeah. Italian woman could play the Japanese Chocho san or something. Yeah. So, so it, it was, it's a historically the convention has been different. I don't know that they do that as much anymore. Oh, they do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a, a opera. But the, the, play, the plays are historically uh, when uh, women were played by men. Uh, historically, that was the case. I mean, women were not allowed on stage in, in certain. Uh, but that's certain certainly areas. changed. Uh, that was then, and this is now. It's yeah. Mary Brown. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's certainly yeah. changed. Like right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And Castrati also were. Uh, right. Uh, right. Right. I think yes. Red had a question. I know sometimes, like, is being like the one person of your culture in a room, sometimes you'll become like the expert or the spokesperson, like, oh, here's a Latina playwright, let's test her what she thinks about right. this issue. Has there ever been a time where you've been put in that position where you're, you've kind of been like, maybe I shouldn't be the expert on this, but by default I am, and how do you kind of navigate that? Pretty much any time I go to LA. <laughs> <laughs> the expert in Latin American culture. Um, I mean, it's hard because, just because people want, I mean, I think there's like a market now and people are starting to realize that you can make money in certain situations and you cast certain types of people. So I think it's hard because, just because somebody wants that sort of race or that story doesn't mean that they want it, all of it. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? They want what they want. Yeah. They want enough to make enough money, but they don't want to know about something other than themselves. So, I mean, yes, I've been in that situation a lot, and it's very uncomfortable, and there's a lot of sort of like language tricks you can use to kind of, you know, say that you should ask someone who's more of an expert than you, you know what I mean? But uh, it's a really difficult situation to be in. It's very uncomfortable, yeah, absolutely. I think it's normal, honestly, to be, s it's very pessimistic view of the world, but yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, the use, this is the kind of a fine line, the cartoon characters, you know, where in other words, it's, it's a play that's larger than life, which will oftentimes strain or walk a fine line with stereotypes, and sometimes for political purposes. I think of I think of Brett, for example. He will use cultural stereotypes, um, and oftentimes in contemporary plays where they're kind of larger than life, and they're you're actually meant to play off stereotypes. Um, What's your gut instinct on those things? Or do you find yourself, when you go to see a play, or when you read a play that is using some sort of cartoonish quality to make points, as to where they're basically using that as laziness, or really using it as an insightful way of attacking or revealing some inherent truth? I think it depends on whether they're using it as laziness right. or if they're right. using it well, as, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it could go either way, but if if it does reach the truth, then then there there are reasons that there that there is a point. Then yeah, it seems to me that that stereotypes, when they're balanced by the truth, that's when they will make a point to me as a, as an audience yeah. member. Um, and there are some stereotypes I just don't want to see anymore. I don't see the point in perpetuating a stereotype that might be hurtful or offensive. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, that's my personal uh, take. I, f we brought up the, uh, the show Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson when we were talking earlier. And there, there is a, that's I think a good example of a show that had a lot of broad stroke, right. um, and it was really offensive to me. If I, I would have walked out if there was, if I w wasn't in the middle of a row and would felt like it would have made a big scene. Hmm. Because I, for me personally, my, I, I was offended by the 
getting laughs at the expense of a person with a disability, the um, the whole story about the Native American culture and not having any people of color in the show, and there was, I mean, a, a lot of things. Um, that was my take. There are other people that might have seen it that thought, well, I, and I, I and as a as a person who's um, who does a lot of um, advocacy and diversity and inclusion in this industry, my head tries to wrap it around saying, is there a, is there a point that I could take away from this where you're saying, like, like what you say, is there something that they're trying to say in another way that could be a positive uh, take from this? And I personally could not walk away from it with that. D do you have any, I'm sure you saw it too, right? Tony voters, we're Tony voters, and so we see everything. Um, I, I, I don't want it to become start slashing other places. No, 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 no. But I will. No, say, I mean, no. to be honest, yeah. um, I mean, I think people forget this because the play ha was about so much other things, and there were thing a lot of things I liked about this particular play. But when we're talking about disability, the deaf character in Clyborne Park, I right. felt, was right. really dealt right. with in an offensive way, uh -huh. as if she was stupid. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think probably the authors of Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson would tell you that, yeah, those were deliberate choices in order to provoke that kind of right. reaction, in order to support the the discomfort that you felt right. so people would have to come face to face with it and the world would be a better place. Uh -huh. yeah. But it's, but no, but I mean intention and intention and impact right. uh, are are two different things. Right. Mm -hmm. And but you both of them have to be attended to, it seems to me. Yeah. You can't just go, well yeah, that's my, I want you know, I wanted I wanted you to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to think about that. It, 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 Uh, well, we're, we're, yeah, we're, um, does anybody have any other questions? So we're actually at, at 7.30. But did anyone tweet us yet, Seth? <laughs> 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 oh, we're going to sit here until somebody tweets us. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for being here and having this conversation with us. Thank you all. And, and thank you. Thank you. And if Alex Timbers was listening, I'm sorry. I'm a big fan of Here Lies Love. <laughs>